Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. I want to try to make this as interesting as possible for law students. It was a long time ago that I was a law student. And in law school, you learn all about substance and procedure. And, and you learn a lot about substance and procedure. But the one thing that I first saw when I got out of law school is the strategy of the interplay between the two, getting a case ready for trial. And in the setting that I'm going to talk about is more in the products liability area as opposed to commercial, because there are some differences in strategy overall. So basically what I did today for you is I broke this down into like four areas, and I'm going to give you like practical examples about strategy, because it's really all about strategy, uh, not just having your little bag of your toolbox of procedural devices to get a case ready and just not knowing how to use them and when to use them. So, so basically what I do first is, um, the first, these are the four areas I'm going to cover, but it's be kind of quick. So, and by the way, I will take questions at the end, but along the way, if you have a question, you really feel the urge, go ahead and do it. Or if you don't understand something, you might repeat it. But the four areas are basically as far as trial witnesses. And what I'm going to talk about is a couple examples on strategy where something looks really obvious, like I should really, I want to cross-examine this witness. Everything points in that direction, and I don't. And the opposite is where there's a situation where you say, there's no way that I should ask that question a single, that witness a single question, but you do. Okay, that's that area. Getting to the jury, that is basically, along the way, you know, a lot of lawyers just go on autopilot and all of a sudden their case gets summary judgment or summaried out because you're not sticking, just keeping your eye to the ball. And that is making sure that your case is properly teed up. Last thing is, uh, the third thing is about weaknesses, and I'm going to get into this in good detail, but know your weaknesses. You know, many, many lawyers that I find, trial lawyers fresh out of law school, and even lawyers that have been doing it for 40 years, they hide from their weaknesses. They avoid weaknesses, and that's something that you really should not do as a trial lawyer. And lastly, on non-economic damages, that's, everyone's always interested in that. How did you get whatever, 20 million, 30 million, 10 million, in a case like that? How do you prove it in the non-economic area? And what that is, it's the area of things like pain and suffering, the esoteric type of damages. And it's, and it's what I have as a way to kind of make it look scientific for a jury, so they really want to bite on your numbers. But so first, let me go to the obvious. Okay, 
should I do the obvious? I'm going to give you two examples of each. Okay, one was, it relates to the case I did back in the early 90s. Okay, and here's the background of the case. It's against the asbestos manufacturer. They make packing products. And they have two defenses, okay? One defense is we are a small mom and pop operation from Massachusetts, and there's no way our product would be in a big power plant down in Florida called Turkey Point. The other defense they had was um, we don't use this type of asbestos called chrysidolite. It's a very lethal type of asbestos. There's different fibers, but we do not have that. And in the pathology, the plaintiff, um, before he died, they, um, uh, they found some chrysidolite. So that's their big defense. And that's all they're talking about from day one in the trial. Now, I go to the document depository, and this is the early 90s. They've been in, in the litigation for like five years. And it became apparent to me that they were sleeping on the job. Because in their thousands and thousands of pages of documents, it's really <coughs> millions of pages, uh, I found a couple documents. One was a product that's used at power plants where they do use chrysidolite. And another was a brochure, a sales brochure, that basically we're not a small mom and pop operation. You can find our products basically in every industrial plant. So now it's, we're getting close to trial. Now we're at trial, and I've got a composite exhibit of hundreds of pages of documents. In there is that, that they produce through my request for production. And so we're there, and the lawyer's like, OK, any objection to putting this into evidence? As composite, whatever it was, 67? No objection. So now it's in evidence. Then it became really apparent to me as you know, we go through jury selection, um, um, we're in an opening statement, and they're saying the same defense. We're a small mom and pop operation, there's no way we're at Turkey Point, and we have no chrysidolite in any of our products, okay? So now I'm sitting there going, wow, this is gonna be great. Let me show you, I'll show you the documents before I get into whether I, 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 I cross-examined the corporate rep because it was an opportunity to look like Superman on cross-exam because he's going to get up there and lie, and you're going to get to blow him out of the water. But basically, here's the document. And this is, this is what we found, and it was, a, it was a, an index. And I went into the index, and that's a blow up of that. Power generating plants. My, my guy did an acid type application, product called 320. So I went and got the, the brochure that was also in there. And if you see what it says, secondly, it's made from South African blue crystal light asbestos. That is the, the one fiber that is the really lethal fiber that they said they never, ever used, okay? So that was really good. So I was really happy about that. And the second was, here's the brochure that basically says that there is a Chesterton product in every industrial plant, which doesn't sound like mom and pop to me, and from Massachusetts. And then, uh, in other words, that is why Chesterton's mechanical packings are universally recognized as the world's finest, okay? So with all that in mind, okay, I've got it sitting there and on the, on, the bail, on the clerk's table. And I was like, I'm going to kill this guy. But you got to, the strategy is like, I think the chance of winning the case is very high at that point, no question. Maybe 90%. But if I want to make it 99% or 100%, you know, I had to like really refrain from the great cross examination, which I really, really was excited to do because you go, great, Perry Mason. And, um, <laughs> but what I did instead was I left the document sitting there knowing that they're going to talk about it, because they did throughout the whole case, and they had no choice in closing argument but to talk about it. So when I closed the case, I'm sorry, I did not mention mom and pop at all, and I did not mention fibers at all in my closing argument. It was a little bit odd. They probably thought it was kind of odd because they didn't even say anything about it. And of course they did. They walked into the trap. And then they notice it's time for rebuttal, okay? And it's in evidence. And this is the old days, the early 90s, and they see the paralegals walk in with these big poster boards of what you just saw. And they're like, time out, judge. Take the jury out. Take the jury out. We need to talk to you. We need to talk to you. Judge is not fair. He's going to put that in evidence. I mean, it's, it's already in evidence. He's going to put that in front of the jury. And he didn't do it through a witness. I say, judge, I don't have to do it through a witness. It's already in evidence. It's in evidence. It's sitting there on the clerk's table. And that's what closing argument is about, talking about the evidence and putting it together. So of course, the judge said, you can do it. And I put that up in front of the jury and rebuttal. Okay? And that's the last, that's the end of it. They can't rebut that. You know, they can't say anything else. It's pretty much case closed, and of course we won that case. But that is basically strategies. So it was obvious to, to most lawyers that you should take that corporate rep and fry them. But that's not the best play. So you always have to really think about winning the war, not just a little battle along, along the way. Now the next one, I'm not going to put documents on, is the opposite. And that, that was in the DuPont case 
It was in the 90s. It was a, the best witness I ever saw in my life. Probably one of the best witnesses on the planet at the time. A guy named Dr. Brent. And um, he looked the part, talked the part. He was a specialist in everything you could think of. Epidemiology, developmental uh, toxicology, teratology, fetal pathology. And man, he could talk. He was good, OK? And I took his deposition for a couple of days. And when it came to trial, I, it was like, this guy was so good. I think the best thing I could do is not ask him anything and just sit there and create some seed of doubt with the jury and just say, no questions. And, um, but I didn't do that. Instead, I, when I read through the transcripts, buried in these big, long, convoluted answers at deposition, there were three really critical elements of my case that he, that, he, that he let out. And one of them was it involved a dermal skin exposure to a chemical. And um, our expert said 3% gets into the blood. Okay. And another was about you know, when you get, when, what happens when it's in the blood. And it gets down to the placenta. That absorbs everything. And in the fetal blood supply, with that kind of exposure that was described in our case, the amount in the fetal blood supply would be in the hundreds of parts per billion. Okay. I said, that's great. So anyway, I cross-examined this guy. I get my butt whipped. I'm up there for 30 minutes. He's slapping me around pretty good. But it, I got those long, convoluted answers that at the time the jury didn't understand during the trial because it's buried in this you know, pile of garbage. But at close, I put it up in front of the jury, the actual transcript. And I even said, listen, I was in my 30s at the time. And I said, listen, Dr. Brown, I just I had to be very humble. So listen, he's the best witness I will probably ever see in my career. He's great. And he really you know, kicked us around the courtroom pretty good. He was testifying for 40 years okay, at that time, before I was born. I said to the jury, he was on the stand doing just what he did in this courtroom before I was born. Okay? But okay, the reason I got up there and did that is because there's three things that was buried in there. And I showed it to the jury. And I said, those are essential elements to our case. So that was it. We won that case. But that, that was a different play. That was where you'd probably say, let's not even bother with it. Just go with our experts and try to win it that way. But he actually had it buried in there in a convoluted fashion. So that was the opposite. So those are two examples on witnesses. And not always, it's not always obvious that you think, or you don't do the obvious. Okay? The next area okay, is getting to the jury. Okay? And I, I call this one, how do I use my toolbox? And that's all like the procedural devices that you learn in civil procedure and how you work up a case. And you've got different things. You've got admissions, requests for admissions. You've got requests for production. You've got interrogatories, depositions. And a lot of times, lawyers just use all those things without really plotting it out. Like, where am I going to go with it? You really have to think in, as, about the setup from the beginning. And you come up with your strategy. But along the way, sometimes things may, you may have to adjust your strategy. And in this particular case, it involved, it was the same one that Brent was in, it was a chemical exposure to a pregnant lady. She was sprayed by a fungicide like seven to 10 weeks into her pregnancy. Um, and, um, and that's exactly, by the way, when the eyes developed. We had 13 experts testify in that case. We had to go piece by piece because chemical companies are different from drug companies. They don't do controlled trials on humans. So it's much tougher science because there's a lot of things that you ethically cannot do in science. So you have to. So what I did is I took accepted science, but piece by piece, and put it together. But anyway, we had a major problem about a year before trial. We, um, the description from the plaintiff was that the spray came out of this big, big tractor with a 36-foot wingspan. The wind shifted. The spray got all over her. But it had no smell, no taste. And it was colorless and odorless. Okay, so when she got sprayed on that on that on that day, which was either November one or November two of 1989, she went back, discussed it with her husband, and they concluded it was probably water. She went to a pediatrician for a scheduled visit the next day, and he said the same. But it turns out that there was a big investigation going on in Great Britain. With the, the, with the London Observer and the BBC, and they're doing this big investigation. And they, they, there's a group of like 165 mothers of children with anophthalmia that's having no eyes. And they were doing this investigation. They contact the farmer, who admitted that they were using a product called Benlate, which has something called Benamil, which is the active ingredient that can cause that, that damage. So now we're, 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 we're the, the farm, we get all their records. And 
it shows that they have 65 different chemicals that they were using at that time. Okay, or they, 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 they had in their records, anyway, that they were using at or about that time. Five of them were odorless, tasteless, colorless. So I'm just sitting there scratching my head. How are we ever going to get past summary judgment if there's five of these products that are odorless, colorless, tasteless? So I'm sitting there and I was like, what are you worried about? And I go, what am I worried about? You know, the burden of proof is better than 50%. And my math is like, that's maybe one in five at best. And, you know, and the, and the guy in the tractor had no clue. He's not going to remember years later whether he's using Bentley, you know, at that specific day or that specific time. They didn't have records that really showed exactly what was in like you'd expect. Um, so I was like, I was really baffled on this one. Like, okay, we need to do something. And um, let me see, does anyone have any idea what you would do? All right, with no hands and a lack of time, I'll tell you what I did, okay? <laughs> um, it, it, and it was, it, was, it was all in. It's either gonna win or you're gonna lose right now. I, I sent out 65 separate requests for admissions, okay? And for those that don't know you, I don't know how far in school you are, but a request for admission is to the party opponent, and whatever their answer is, they either admit or deny, whatever the, 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 the statement is, and it's binding against them. If you, if you bring it into trial as evidence against them, they cannot refute it. So if they say we weren't using it on that day, they can't bring in other evidence, they can't refute it, they're done. Case closed. So I had to take a shot, and I sent out 65 requests for admissions, and basically, the name of the farm was Pine Island Farm. And this, I sent 65 separate ones, followed by 65 separate interrogatories. And basically what it said, and I, I put Bravo there, because that's a different chemical. The one we were looking at was Benlate. There's all these other ones, Trigard. I'm not going to show you all 65. But basically, this is one of the 65. So that's the, admi the admission. We're asking them to admit or deny that statement. <laughs> we're using it between November 1 and November 15, followed by an interrogatory that if it's affirmative, Give us the information, who, what, when, where, and how, and why, okay? And um, so you have 30 days to respond to this. And as I was on pins and needles, it's like waiting for a jury verdict. And if they just admit, which would have been the smarter thing to do, I'm right where I started. <laughs> how am I going to prove which one it was? But here's what they did. This is, this, is their, this is the answer, the same answer you got for all 65, basically, is that there's a remote shot that they were using it, but not before November 10. Okay, so they're done because the testimony from the plaintiff is November 1 or November 2. So they're done at that point. Of course, they said the interrogatories were not applicable because the answer was they denied it. So now, I mean, when I was at trial, it was really kind of fun. It was cool because we spent two days putting on all the testimony from different people about, uh, and workers and so on about the Benlate. And then I go, Judge, I want to read 64 responses to requests for admissions. We explain to the jury what they are, and she starts with that. And, you know, DuPont had like a dozen lawyers in court, three firms, and you can hear all the pencils breaking because at that point, that's the first time they even realized what happened. And um, they were, you know, that was it. And it was, that, I, I took my time. I read each one very slowly, put them in a little stack, went through the next one. It was very powerful during the trial. So, you know, that, that worked out well for us. The case would have been a summary judgment against us otherwise. All right, that's, that's area Two, basically, that's like strategy. That's getting your case to to the jury. But she basically. didn't put in the one. That no, when you, well, yeah, she. That's very good. She's right. Sixty-four, I put up there. Sixty-five, I did not. Okay, and the reason is, they can't, and they cried about that too. Um, why aren't you putting up the one about Bentley? Because I don't have to do that. It's it's an evidence against them. And they can't use it for themselves, so they're done. That's it. Okay. And I, they, I said, Judge, we get two days of testimony. Judge says, Absolutely, you don't have to do that. And I had two days of testimony about the mental Just look at that if you want to talk about mental aid. So anyway, that's how it works. So you need to really, you know, be focused on things and always, you know, don't be on autopilot thinking the trial's a year away. You know, always think about how do I stand? Do I need to make an adjustment? What can I do? Okay. Now the next thing is um, know your weakness. Okay. And this is. Um, what I briefly said, most lawyers do, is they kind of hide from the weaknesses. They just, they kind of ignore it, and especially if it's a boring type of weakness, you know? And, and, and what is, you know, I, I phrase it as, what should I do about my Achilles heel? There are like Achilles heels in litigation overall, okay? For instance, in tobacco cases, the Achilles heel of a tobacco case is the concept of addiction, okay? 
That's the weakest part of the case from the plaintiff's side of the ball. Okay, you getting a jury, getting sick people, wherever you are, to buy into the concept that someone is addicted to smoking cigarettes, which they are. There's no question that it exists, and it's nicotine, and it's addictive, it's a drug, and they put it in there intentionally to get people to keep smoking. But a lot of people just don't buy that because, you know, hey, my dad quit, you know, my mom quit, you know, and it's like, it's a tough one. That's the Achilles heel in tobacco. In asbestos, the Achilles heel, and exposure, by the way, to cigarettes is not the Achilles heel, okay? when you compare that to asbestos. Everyone knows I smoke marbles for 20 years. Asbestos cases are completely different. The Achilles Hill there is exposure because you're trying to get a jury to buy into um, an exposure that happens say, at the Quincy Shipyard from 1965 to 1970 where there's hundreds of products. So you gotta get, you gotta get the evidence in that really comes, you know, focuses on the products, the defendants that are in the courtroom and that's tough, and that's, that's a tough thing, and also the, the, the lapse in time. It's a latent disease, so you're going back 30 years, hundreds of products. A lot of people say, oh, come on, there's no way you can remember that, you know? But there is. And um, so anyway, when you look at weaknesses, diagnosing your weakness, those are very general weaknesses in very big areas of law, but it's, it's typical. Determine what your weakness is, analyze your weakness, then address your weakness, okay? Address it, embrace your weakness, and make it into a strength, okay? And what I basically mean by that is the, is the basic five words that apply to everything, okay? When you become a lawyer, if you become an engineer or a doctor, it's the same words that you basically look at all the time. What, when, where, how, and why. And even in a deposition, when someone answers a question and they go to a different area, those are the questions you get back to. How did that happen? When, where? You keep, if, you, if you live with those, by the way, if, if I leave you with one thing today, as trial lawyers, if, if that's what you become, just always think those five words. It's the same thing. I mean, it's basic. It's really basic. You've probably heard it before, but it really, really applies. So now I'm going to give you an example of okay, a case that, that I did recently. Actually, um, it was actually a verdict I had in August, and I tried, my, uh, I tried a case with my son. Okay, it's his first trial, put your hand up, James, back there. So he's right now, he's 1-0, and o, technically he's 1-0, and o, with a $17 million average. So he's got a tough... <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it was a great experience for me to try a case with my son. It really was. I mean, it was a lifetime experience, and I, I wanted to do it. So I picked one that was kind of tough, because I wanted him to really learn it the right way. Okay, and this case involved an exposure that happened in Saudi Arabia, in 1977 and 78. There was a guy that was living in Great Britain um, with his, um, his newlywed wife, and he went to Saudi Arabia on one of those excursions where he worked for like 10 months to make a lot of money tax-free. They used to do it with the Alaska Pipeline and all that, so that type of job. And it was like for a company, um, a subsidiary or, or an affiliate of Raytheon, okay? And um, the, uh, it really turned into a great case for, for my son James as a learning experience because of the following. Um, I told him over and over, you know, the weakness is, is exposure. And you need to talk about the exposure part of the case once you develop it. In jury selection, you need to talk about an opening statement because as a plaintiff, you get to go first. Don't sit there and don't even talk about these witnesses that they have. You need to talk about those witnesses that they have when you get to talk first. You know, you have to preempt that type of thing. So basically... They came up at the 11th hour with two witnesses. And, 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 and to lay out what the exposure was, it was against Georgia Pacific, okay? And the plaintiff was exposed to a joint compound, okay? And, they, and he worked on a military housing. They were making 500 military houses for the Saudi military. And uh, so they had nothing to really refute that. So all of a sudden, there's these two mystery witnesses, okay? And they're going to say, basically, that... He didn't use, there was no Georgia Pacific joint compound on that job. And, and they, had a, they, they had this guy named Urso that they wanted to put Urso on the same job with the plaintiff, whose name was Taylor, okay? And, and to just merely to refute that there's no way I was on the same job and there was no Georgia Pacific products there. Now, granted, we had a lot of other evidence. There were shipments, to, it was in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. There were shipments of, of wallboard and very scant amounts of shipments of joint compound which we got by that in closing argument because it was sold as a system. No one buys Georgia Pacific wallboard without the joint compound. But in this, they were trying to be cute, and we called them out on that because we had a lot of you know, wallboard. But anyway, we had that kind of evidence. Now, we're so there to say that it's, it's, it wasn't there. That's basically his purpose. So you have to really get into those questions, how, what, when, where, and why, and take the depositions and really focus, get real deep into it. 
My investigator came back and said, they had another witness too, his, his name was Gubb. And my, the investigator came back and said, the guy sounds like a drunk, I wouldn't even waste my time with him. I said, James, you talk to everybody when you're in discovery. Everybody and find out what's there. And so basically, here's what happened at trial. I had to spend a half hour of my total of one and a half hour closing argument. I had to call Urso a liar, because he was a liar. But the facts were all over the place. So you have to clinically go down through all the facts and make some sense of it. So what I did was the following. OK, I put, I put Urso up there. who's the, He's the liar, OK? And I, and I had to say in closing argument, this guy's a liar. I really, it's the first time I've ever done it in a trial, say, this guy's a liar. So what they did, the first thing they did, they tried to create credibility. So I, I called them out on that. And what they did was, I went through all the common denominators. They wanted a lot of common denominators to show that Urso was the same place as Taylor. But here's one problem, that, here's one thing that I noticed, is that all of the information that Urso put, Dr. Voss, the name of the project, all the thing that's consistent with Roy Taylor was all provided by Roy Taylor. Because Roy Taylor was deposed first, and all the evidence under source was provided to the other side before Urso's deposition, OK? So now Urso, who's there basically, you know, he really did fabricate. This is what we had. Now, if you see the last two, was Roy there? This is jewelry guy thing. This is really cute. I thought this is really cute. At the deposition, uh, it, there's a photograph that we provide. It says Roy's photograph. And it's just because what we did is I said I told my son, James, you have to create Saudi Arabia. So what we did is we got whatever photos. His wife was a pack rat, so we were lucky. She had photos of him in Saudi Arabia. One was with this guy. And she also had his passport, which was off the chart great because it shows all of the entries and exits out of Saudi Arabia, out of Jeddah, at the time. So now it becomes more, that doesn't win the case for you, but it makes it very real. You know? So Roy referred to this guy in the photograph as a nice guy. Yeah, he, he was like he sold jewelry or something like that. So of course, the Urso, the liar, he's at that position. He goes, yeah, that's the jewelry guy. He even gave me a gold ring, and I've never taken it off. He pulls it up in the deposition, this ring. And I was like, spare me. It's like a, it's, it's been on my finger for 30 years. So meanwhile, that, that was all to create credibility. Okay. Now, Urso also said, I was always at the warehouse two hours a day, and I know there was no George Pacific there because I was there. Their products were not there. Although Gubb, by the way, the guy who... My investigator said, sound like a drunk, you know, don't waste your time. He was actually 88 years old, okay? He had a stroke, and he went to Princeton in Columbia, and he was the head of the entire job, okay? So he was not a dummy by any means. He was actually a very smart guy. He talked with sort of speech because he had a stroke. But anyway, he, and by the way, Gubb was not a liar. They would have been better off without Gubb. He was not a liar. But they needed Gubb because Gubb was going to prove that Urso was there. So here's what happened next. Okay, that's the credibility, okay? And they, all the common denominators to show that I'm there so I can say Roy Taylor didn't work with that product. The next thing I did is I, I put all this together. I'm going to compare their two witnesses, okay? Urso, the guy on the left, and we get into it. Look at all the inconsistencies between their two witnesses. The, these are their guys. Okay, the head of the project says that the base wasn't even in, it was not in Jeddah. It was called the American Defense Compound. There was 250 to 300 people. There were no Turks there, okay, as opposed to Turks, which is what Taylor said, and which is true, and which Ursa said, which is true, but fabricate, part of his fabrication. And when you go down the entire list, these two guys clearly were on different jobs. There's no question about that. No question about that at all. So the next chart I put up, and this took time with the jury, because they, they hear all these numbers. They hear about 75 duplexes. They hear about 500. They hear about, so it's all confusing. So as a trial, you have to put it together and make it sensible. And that, it takes a little while to do that. So then that, the last one I did is I called it a comparison of two honest men. That was Gubb, who was the head of the entire project, and Mr. Taylor, the plaintiff. And here's what it is. And here's what they showed, that the years in Saudi Arabia were different. One place was 10 miles north of Jeddah. Taylor was in Jeddah. There were Turks, and he had 500 homes. And if you read some of the other bits from the transcript, you know, what's the explanation? Raytheon may have had multiple projects going on, which they did, OK? It was the largest boom in Saudi Arabia history. Um, you know, and he may have made a comment about Urso. He didn't want to get into it, because I think Urso was you know, stealing money or doing something. But he didn't want to talk about it at the depot. But he said that before, you know. And Taylor would have had entry and exit figures. Figures printed in his passport, which we had. 
So anyway, that's what we had to do, and that's really attacking your weakness. So a lot of lawyers I see would just, just run away from it and just say, my guy's a better guy, a better witness, he's more honest, you have to, you know. But they have two, we have one, it's like a numbers game. And that's, so that's basically, you know, an example of ascertaining the weakness, attacking the weakness, and making that into your strength. So it became a strength because at that point, once you get through all this, and the jury, we had a, 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 a good jury, we had a bright juror who was the foreman, and, um, uh, and she basically got it, and they, they got it. But that's, it's your, you know, it actually almost solidified it for us when we went through all the evidence. So then the, um, all right, so anyway, that's, uh, that's that area. Okay, and the last area that I want to talk about, see, I know this thing goes so fast, non-economic damages. This people, uh, lawyers find this very interesting. How do you get those numbers? How do you get big numbers? And the way that you get big numbers is basically by trying to make it sound scientific, okay? And what I typically do is, um, well, and part of it, you have to give them a good basis, too. So yeah, you, you can't just throw a number. You know, the, my, my guys say, this guy has a year to live, basically. And uh, some mesothelioma, a very painful disease. So you have to make sure you establish all that, how bad the disease, how painful it is, how you die from the disease. And you get all that. So you got to get all that in. And then you have to tell the jury that, you know, it depends on the state, but most states you can do, like, the type of argument I'm going to do here, the majority of states you can, but, and, and including Massachusetts. But the, um, is that you got to be very humble with it because you're going to ask for big numbers, but you've got to always be confident in your numbers. You've got to look them right in the eye. And don't. I tell the young lawyers because they get scared. Wow, $20 million, that's a lot of money. And they don't, you got to look them in the eye. But basically, as a lawyer, my obligation is to, you know, present a way to calculate damages. You as a jury, it's your obligation to do the calculation. And, and you know, I'd be remiss if I did not present you with a formula, you know, on behalf of the plaintiff. And so what I do is we suggest a formula to them. And the formula that we typically suggest is based on units of time. And it would go kind of along these lines. Everything in life is based on time, OK? Everything we do, we quantify our sleep to whatever hours that might be, eight hours. Our commute took 45 minutes. Uh, I went to dinner with my wife for two hours. I worked 10 hours. Even life itself is quantified in years. And, you know, and, and so everything, so it makes sense. So you say, okay, we should do it based on time, OK? Units of time. And along the way, we throw up other little things, like no matter who it might be, it depends on the jurisdiction. Don't throw up baseball player salaries unless you're in a jurisdiction you can't do per diem, because then that, that's where you can do that kind of stuff. But like little things, like if a, I, I like to do this with an expert. If um, you have a, an expert that's on the other side that's kind of like doesn't come off too good, and his rate of pay is, say, $750 an hour, along the way, say, look, you know, whatever you do, whatever you I mean, you could be a police officer or an expert witness, and your job is to testify in court, and that's what you do when you spend 10 hours for $750. You've earned $75 because you did your job. And what we have here, for Mr. Whoever it might be, his, you can call it, sometimes you've got to be careful calling it a job, but his job technically is basically to die. It's a job he didn't apply for, he can't retire from, can't quit. He got it from the other side. So what we do is we also, and I'm going to show you some charts, but before I get into that, I want to show you the, the, the foundation for it. And this is actually a doctor from Brigham and Women's, Dr. Bueno. He's the head of the Mesothelium Project. He's a graduate of this, uh, this university. And... Um, but how do you die from mesothelioma? And I just, to, to make it quick, because we're short on time, I highlighted some of the, the, the salient parts. And patient suffocates, doesn't have enough blood pressure, and dies. And by the way, the tumor invades into the nerves around the chest wall, causing extreme pain. So age, pain management's a huge issue. And then it's in the, it just pushes on the lungs and heart until they just can't breathe and they die, OK? Then what is the precise cause of death? from mesothelium, you just slowly suffocate. It's a very painful way to go. So you want that in there if you're going to ask for the numbers. Now, I'm going to give you an example of what we asked for in this particular case. And I, what I do is, OK, I have John Doe up here because I don't want to start naming people. What I typically do will say, and what I do here is like, I suggest, and you do, I suggest, and you always have to be humble. I suggest, um, and you can go higher, you can go lower. And what I always do is I challenge the other side. When I put the formula up, I will say, this is my obligation. If they have a better formula, I use their formula. And if you come up with a better formula, use it yourself. But this is what we 
This is what we suggest as counsel. And then we put up your $600 to $800 an hour, and we do it by the days. And what this does, and this is the past, this is from diagnosis up to the date of trial. And what that does, you know, because I'm my CPA background, I'm, I'm into numbers, but, but, but the thing is, even if you're not a CPA, people, you know, subconsciously react to this stuff. I've got boundaries up there on that. And the boundaries, that's my playing field, is the 8,755, and the other boundary is 11,673. And every time that I've done this argument and won, they've always been within my boundaries. Then for the future, we do, you know, we go higher. This is where he's going to have the really gruesome death. So we go higher, and you talk about all that. And I have to do this quick because of time. <laughs> but the, um, now, Jane Doe, now what I use Jane Doe for, that's the consortium part of the case. I call this my insurance policy because what I do is I put really, really low per diem numbers up there because this is based on the joint life expectancy of the plaintiff and if he has a wife, his wife. So if, there, if he's going to live, say he should have lived based on the mortality tables another 20 years and her life expectancy is 30 years, the joint life expectancy would be 20 years. Okay? So what she's entitled to is some consortium and that type of thing. So for the past, what I do is I put up numbers that are, you know, 100 to 150. And that's because that goes from the diagnosis to what's going on up to now. For the next, like, I think this was 12 years. Okay, 12 years. I put numbers in. You say, well, why would the numbers be lower in the future? Because he's going to die within a year. I, I blend it together because the next 11 years after, that's post-death. And I typically, in my case, when I write, I always say all the defense arguments. If, the, if Like they like to talk about, she's, well, she's got a support group. I say all that. She's got great kids. She's got great neighbors. She's got a good support group. But who knows? Maybe someday she'll even remarry. There's no evidence of that, but maybe, you know, and I, I blow out the sympathy and all that. But what I've done here psychologically, I've got numbers there that are really low, $25 an hour. In some states, that's the minimum wage. So I look like Joe Reasonable, even though I've got $1,500 on the board, you know, in the, in the, in the prior. And you go back to here, I've got $1,500. But overall, how do you, you know, how do I not look like Mr. Reasonable when I've got numbers in a death case as low as $25 an hour, okay? So basically, that's, there's a lot more to it. There's all these little, little plants that we put in the argument for the psychologically to get people in your area. I don't have time to do it. I could do the whole class just on this, but, but I just want to give you a taste of it, you know, as a, as a trial lawyer. And uh, basically, then we summarize it. And this, again, is the playing field. This is... John Doe, that gives the overall, the past and the future. It goes 15 to 21, you know, and four to seven, basically. So anyway, since we're, that's time, that's, I think I got it all out. I, th I got all four areas. Now I'll take questions. Why do you not have um, number signs and um, the other chart? This, um, I thought he had an error on his no. slide. He only had one yeah. dollar sign. I said, Jim, why don't you no. have dollar signs? Yeah. That's a psychological thing. You know, for, that's a numbers thing, too. Um, you don't put decimals and zero, zero, because you put more zeros on and everything kind of psychologically, subconsciously looks bigger. So I don't have dollar signs all over the place. They know it's dollars, you know, but you don't even remind them that it's dollars and it's $20 million and dollar, dollar, dollar. So we kind of, little things like that, they're all subliminal, but they all, they all come into play. So a lot of, you know, thought goes into that. But um, anyway, any questions? Okay, we have one in the back. Yeah, well, the foreman is, is um, when the jury goes back, the first thing they do in almost every state is they, among themselves, they select the foreman. And the foreman does not have any special vote. They just basically um, control the deliberations. You know, someone who sits there and controls it, like, you know, it's like, um, Professor, you speak now. Because if two people, I want to talk, you know, okay, it's Professor. And that, they, they just control it. But they just have a single vote like anyone else, and, um, and they sign the verdict at the end. In fact, our form in that case was pretty good. I got really one of my best, my best um, jury. Quite it was like from a plaintiff lawyer's perspective, like two of the best questions you could ever get from a jury is um, can can we can we have a calculator? That's a good one if you're looking for money, right? And another one is um, can we award more than the plaintiff asked for? All right. So the first time in my career. Um, 
we got the, you know, can we have a calculator question, which was great. It was really cool, because everyone's outside with their cell phones, and the other side was a dozen cell phones. It was like the you know, New York Stock Exchange. Everyone's like calling, oh my god, we got a bad question. <laughs> was like, so but anyway, that was, that was fun, and, and uh, with a little smiley face on it, too, you know. <laughs> right. Yes? No, it's not a bad thing at all. Because what I think is a really bad thing is when um, a company sells a product that's lethal for many, many, many years, knows it, and there's, there's and that's, I'm, I'm gonna get into the ugly part of the case because I didn't get into the actual knowledge of these defendants. When they have documents that show that they were aware of the danger and they made conscious business decisions to keep selling it, and people like your grandfather gets exposed to it as a blue collar worker at the Quincy shipyard and dies from it, I don't think when you get to that point, you're gonna sit there and say, it, it, you know, it, that's not good, you know? This presupposes that you're on the good side, but now it's right. your... Well, I mean, I, I like to think I am on the good side, and I, I believe in it, but that is part of the system of justice, okay? Justice is not a guaranteed result, but what it is, it's the interplay between the two lawyers, and the truth is supposed to come out. And, you know, that's how it works. And, uh, and what we did there with the charts, with the witnesses, that's all based on sound facts and testimony in the record. Okay, and, I, and unfortunately, you know, that's what it was, you know, and I, I mean, I like to think I'm better than the other lawyers, and I, 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 I you know, I take that as a compliment that you think that, that I'm, I'm okay, you know, but the thing is, at the end of the day, even a bad lawyer can win if the facts are not good for the plaintiff, I mean, but if it's close, sometimes it could happen that, that, that the wrong side could win, and even in justice, that happens, if that can happen. You know? Yes? See, this is probably a naive question, but... Uh, are, are lawyer, litigators, lawyers, mm -hmm. pleading before a judge, are they uh, uh, under oath, can, and can they be prosecuted for perjury? Oh, if you if you if you subordinate perjury, you absolutely can, absolutely can. If you assist, if you subordinate perjury, that that's right, you absolutely could. But that's not what you know. That's not what it is here. This is all, everything's based on testimony. Well, you said that the, the other lawyer is going to get up and lie. No, it wasn't the lawyer. It was the witness. It was a witness. It was a witness. It was a witness. It was a witness. And it's a civil proceeding. And usually, in a civil proceeding, I mean, to make first of all, there's a big disparity in the burden of proof between a civil proceeding and a criminal proceeding. The burden of proof in a civil proceeding is more likely than not. In a criminal case, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. So, if a prosecutor wanted to make a case on his lie, he could try it. He could try it. But the guy can come up with umpteen reasons why. You know, I was, you know, I, I was, I remember more now. It was 40 years ago. I mean, there's a lot of things they can come up with. It's not as good a criminal case to prosecute a lying witness like that on that set of facts. I think, but that's just my own humble opinion. So, you know, the, right. so the, the, these tobacco cases and asbestos cases. Right. Uh, are they criminal cases? Or no, no, they're, they're all civil. They're all civil. They're civil. Well, why aren't they criminal cases? <laughs> who are you going to prosecute? Uh, the chairman of RJR? I mean, yeah. technically, the ones, the, ones that, the ones I think that should have been prosecuted was in, back in 1994 when they all went in front of Congress and they put their hands up and they said that tobacco does not cause lung cancer. And those guys probably should have been criminally indicted. You know, I agree with that. But beyond that, I mean, you know, it's... It is what it is. I mean, they, you know, they put the resources where they choose to. I one over here too. Yeah, go ahead. So you, talk, you talk a lot about psychology and like cognitive biases, whether it be the dollar signs or other things. I'm curious, as is that just based on your years of experience that you picked up, or are you very conscious about like trying to figure out what the cutting edge psychology is and how to use that? It's 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 really through experience and you know really more, more through experience and, and reading. I, I mean I, I when I started practicing law, um, I I I'm, I've got you know, friends all over the, the country and in other countries too that are really good lawyers and they all worked with mentors and I was kind of weird. I started my firm, you know, two years out of law school and my mentor I would go I would just go to the law school and this was the old days pre internet I couldn't sit there on my laptop, you know, I had to go there and dig into it and just look up closing arguments from the what I thought were the best lawyers and read them. And, and I just read them. And I said, you know, I like what Bell I did in California in this case and I you know and I kinda of did it like that's kinda of weird. I'm kind of an enigma in that regard. But but I, I just you know, you read. <laughs> yeah. Right. So there was also some coordination. Did you engage in that coordination? 
Well, well, it's, it's harder on our side. It's easier on their side, and I'll tell you why. It's because the commonality that you find in those cases is more with regard to the science, which really applies across the board. But from our side, literally every case has a different exposure. I mean, you're not going to find... The, I've never had, we've represented tens of thousands of people, and we have never had one of these same exact identical exposure case. I mean, it's similar ones. You know, I worked at the Quincy Shipyard for five years, and I was a pipe fitter, and I, you know, I worked five days a week. You might find another guy that did those exact years in that job, but there's still, his recollection may be different than the other, so there's a lot of things that come into play, but from our side, every case is different. From their side, every case is different, too, because of the exposure issue, you know? That's the only difference that they really have. But on the science, though, that's pretty much, you know, and then, and then you know, there's joint efforts, you know, on the defense side. And that's the other thing, too, in, in response to the, um, the, I think it was the first question about how, um, you know, God, is it, that's, that's not, I didn't see, you didn't really say it's not fair, but is that, whatever, but you don't understand what goes on on the other side, okay? I'll give you an example. The Supreme Court decision we just won last week, it's called Auburn. You tell me if you think this is fair, okay? Okay, what happens with law generally is, if you go to Great Britain and you look at their laws now, over time, generally, rights erode, okay? Through, because it's the way our democratic process is, you know, you get lobbies and they go and they say, listen, we want an exception to this, we want an exception for nuclear plants, and eventually the laws erode, erode, erode. And, um, you know, it gets down to the point where there's like, there's, there's hardly anything left. Now, Auburn, okay, which was at the Supreme Court, I, I argued that uh, April 8th of 14, it just came out last week, it's like this 58 something page decision that reaffirms strict liability. So basically what they want to do with strict liability is, and it was starting to happen in the appellate courts, um, and there's a lot of lobbies for it from business, and I hate to, I'm not anti-business by the way, I love business, but the thing is, um, the, 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 there's something in the third restatement of torts called the risk utility test. In the second restatement of torts, it's called the consumer expectation test. Under the consumer expectation test, a consumer is entitled to expect a product to be safe. Like if you buy a car, you can drive your car and expect your car not to just blow up when you're driving down the road. Okay? That seems fair enough, and that is the law. Okay? Except there's some states, a couple states, like three maybe, and they're trying to get in other states where they do risk utility, which means a plaintiff that goes to court, like you got to go to court, your car blew up, and the, your best friend got killed and you got burned and whatever, and now you um, are going to court and it's risk utility, you not only have to prove that the car blew up and you got injured, you also have to prove that there was a safe alternative. So you have to go in if you're against GM and prove that GM could have made a safer car. Now, should that be your burden? That's really not even strict liability anymore with that. And that is what risk utility is, okay? And that's where the law is going. And over time, things like that happen. So I was very pleased with this decision last week because it goes all the way back to 1976 when Florida had a case called West Beef Caterpillar where they adopted strict liability strict products liability, and it started to erode, and this decision took it right back where it belongs, back to 1976. Yes? So I want to follow up on just uh, a part of Lynn's question and actually ask you to think a little bit about that now with your wall about Wall's hat on. Um, <laughs> so I'm curious, the, the most specific part of the question is, how do you, how do you fund this kind of litigation yourself? Uh, because it's, it's very expensive, particularly for lots and lots of particularly if you're not coordinating with other uh, mm -hmm. plaintiff's counsel, which is right. what they did in a lot of the early asbestos. They did. Cases. That's true. That's, That's very true. Lynn was asking about. Like, and um, like and the second question is, do you think, and again, this maybe goes to a fairness point of view, it would be better if you could fund it other ways from either your own pocket, right. which I take it, is, or bank right. loans. Right. And that goes to what your view would be about everything from third party litigation funding to um, uh, to various kinds of investment in right. plaintiff's law firms. Right. If you mentioned right. law without right. law, we know that the right. biggest publicly traded law firm in the world is a plaintiff's right. law right. firm precisely for this reason. So right. I'd like to first how do you yeah. currently fund it and then second what well, you like well, the, the, I'd like to do it in reverse, if you don't mind, but the, again, the reason I like to do it in reverse is because that's kind of how they do it in Great Britain now, you know? In Great Britain, if you, want, if you have a case, you apply for funding from the government, and uh, that's how it works, basically, you know? You, the solicitor gets a case, puts it together, they, they apply for funding. 
and then the, the government decides whether you get it or not. And that hasn't really worked too well because what happens is the attack now goes on that system. So you can't get funding, and no one really wants to fund cases anymore. So that's how they atta the, the attack always goes to the mechanism. And that's, that, that, so that's a, that hasn't really worked too well in Great Britain. As far as me funding cases, um, I've done some. I mean, I have enough cases in the system now. Once I, it gets up and going, there's enough money coming in. We've got you know, quite a bit of money coming in, although I've done some through stupidity. When I did the DuPont case back in the 90s, I, you know, uh, Mrs. Castillo came into my office in 1993, and uh, that was probably my third year of making big dollars as a plaintiff lawyer. And I was feeling very happy, and the world was great. And, you know, and she came in crying because her son had no eyes, and um, she'd been to two other lawyers, and no one would take the case. And I wasn't going to take the case. And I gave her a little spiel about, you know, you got to move on with your life. That's the best thing you could do. You know, don't dwell on this thing. And then I said, okay, listen, I will look and see what's out there in science. This is the old days, not the internet days. You had to go, so you had to go get there's a librarian in DC. And I said, find anything you can on ventilate and health, or Benamil and health. And there was a rat study done at the University of California in 1991 where they tested the chemical on pregnant rats. And like 43% of the rat offspring in that study were born with ocular abnormalities, including anophthalmia. So I said, okay, I tell you what I'm gonna do. I will, I call her, I'll take the case, but I can't guarantee anything, and we may have to pull out, because it's DuPont, and it's a single defendant case, and the beauty, by the way, to the other cases we have, the asbestos cases, we, when we go to trial, we typically have settled with a number of other defendants, so the case is funded by the defendants, and the, the other defendants in the case, and that's, part of the answer to, to that. But uh, with this case, it was, it was a really risky proposition. I took it, and um, at times I almost, I regretted it, you know, and I ended up on this roller coaster ride, and it worked out, but it was a 10-year project. We won at trial, and um, it was on court TV, televised and all that. We went to the appellate court, and they came in with half of Washington, D.C. The head of Kirkland Ellis, a guy named Warren, had to personally argue it, okay? He replaced Ken Starr. The third chair at oral argument was a guy named Arthur England, who was the ex-chief justice of the Florida Supreme Court. And this is at a Florida appellate court. And he was basically carrying the sandwiches for lunch. And, um, you know, and I had a female appellate lawyer at the time, and they had a blue suit panel. We were on, you know, and they, they, they reversed the verdict. You know? But I just, you know, we just said, I'm going to take a shot with the Supreme Court, which is about a one in 100 shot. And lo and behold, the Supreme Court took the case. And the Supreme, we, we argued it, and uh, it took two and a half years for that opinion, which was a monumental opinion. It was about Daubert versus something called the Fry Standard, and we won that. And that was kind of like the law of the land in Florida until they passed Daubert statutorily in 2012, I think. So anyway, that, that case, though, from beginning, to, from the day she walked in to the day we got our final word from the Supreme Court was a decade. You know? So you don't make money on that kind of thing. <laughs>